so I'm super excited for our next hybrid event. It's all about when private investments um, create a trend. So as you know, taking investments, there's lots of risks. And I'm super excited because Remy and Matt are going to talk all about how we, um, how the public development banks can make more progress and move forward. So as an investor myself, I'm also an investor with Atomica, I'm one of the angels. I'm super excited. So I'll be taking notes on my phone. Make sure you've got your notebooks out as well. I'll be taking loads of notes. It's going to be epic. Okay. I'm going to hand over to Matt Tempo. Well, welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so we have, of course, um, Matt and uh, Rami, who I can see on the screen. Hello, Rami. And my name is uh, Sylvia. Sylvia Pavoni. I'm a journalist uh, within, with the Financial Times uh, group. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here to talk about public, public development banks um, and how they can really help uh, to, of course, um, support global growth, uh, but also uh, to support a better uh, and more lasting global growth so welcome again to everyone welcome to uh the public here it's actually quite uh, nice to to be in a room with other people in such a lovely room as well and welcome to everyone who is watching from their kitchen tables perhaps uh or on their computers anyway so uh, let's start talking uh about uh public development banks uh and uh and what uh has changed uh particularly over the past um year when the requirements on what they, what these organizations have been called to do is, is clearly uh, skyrocketed. Uh, uh, they have been called to help support uh, economies that uh, maybe were struggling in terms of financing at a time in which the, the, the traditional donor countries were also dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, pressures on their public finances. So I'm going to um, ask Remy first, but also I'm very keen to hear Matt's point of view on this. Remy. How tough has the past year been? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sylvia, and, uh, and, and, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be with you S far away. Sorry, I was traveling uh, again, and I was in Cairo um, until late <laughs> this night. Uh, and I'm, I'm but I'm extremely pleased to, to discuss with you, particularly with, uh, with Matt, uh, Splendid partnership between um, the Aga Khan Foundation and, and the Agence Française de Développement (AFD). I'm, I'm heading, so uh, I'm sure uh, a lot, a lot to share and to explain uh, your your audience. Yes, you, you, you're right, Sylvia. Development finance is uh, is everywhere <laughs> uh, at the heart of uh, the G7 summit. Uh, soon. Uh, for COP26, for COP15, uh, for so many issues on vaccines, of course, because of um, um, short-term financial needs in the crisis, but also because of uh, the long-term um, transformation um, uh, we have to, to realize and, and that we are more and more uh, aware, aware of. And the very interesting point is that uh, we are living a complete redefinition of what uh, development finance uh, is about. Previously, I would say before 2015, uh, yes, it was a it was an issue for donors. It was about uh, ODA. It was about pure solidarity and only for a very small set uh, of um, of countries. It it has changed really because of the the magnitude of the challenges and because we are living in the world in common uh, where we have to face global challenges and share uh, experiences uh, all together and so we need um, i call it sustainable development investment we need another vision of development finance that would be uh, at scale uh, and that will go deep uh, into uh, um, the countries, into the territories, into the, the constituencies and not stay as a pure international uh, affair. And I think that was, uh, that was really the message that was sent in 2015 uh, with uh, the Paris Agreement, of course, and the SDGs. And um, of course, not for development finance in itself. Now, the, the big question is how do we use these scarce public resources uh, to reorient and to embark as many financial flows as possible. It, it was stated in Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement 
very clearly to make finance um, not a means to an end, but an end in itself in the fight uh, against uh, climate change. So maybe I'll stop here, but just to say that this huge transformation, enlargement, ambition um, has been um, captured uh, last year uh, during the Finance in Common Summit we organized here in Paris, gathering, uh, well, the 450 public development banks existing in the world, in each and every country, actually. Uh, and when you, uh, when you add the financial capacities of all these institutions, it amounts to $2.5 trillion, 10% of all investments on a yearly basis, public and private. And so if we, structure, if we mobilize, if we uh, demultiply the capacities of these very special institutions as both sensors of what is happening and actors of the transformation, I'm absolutely convinced uh, it will make um, a huge, a huge difference. Thank you, Remy. So 10% of uh, the world's global investment coming brought from public and private um, uh, sector sources, which is uh, phenomenal. And of course, I should remind uh, everyone that Remy is not only the CEO of France's uh, public development, um, AFD, but also the, the president of uh, the Finance in Common um, initiative, which uh, Remy just, uh, just mentioned. Uh, Matt, is that what uh, you've also seen? So the, this um, more important role of, of development banks, and has it been helpful? Uh, among the communities that uh, that you work with, and of course, uh, Matt, as you can tell from your programs and from what is what, what is written just behind us, is the global director of institutional partnership and the CEO for the UK um, at the Aga Khan Foundation. Thanks, Sylvia, and and uh, I, absolutely. I mean, I think I would. Uh, I think Remy has put his finger on precisely the importance uh, of public development banks and on uh, what is, I think, what we're seeing happen right now. Uh, as, as he said, I think very helpfully, um, you know, it's a transition that's been building over time, starting uh, with the Paris Agreement, but you can really see during this year under the, the pandemic, this, I, I, I think he's called it a paradigm shift, this paradigm shift about what public development ba banks can do and must do in all of our countries, uh, not only to respond to the, the pandemic itself and to think about the post-recovery, but to address long-term trends and problems of inequality in all of our economies, as well as the green transition. And so I think that in a way, what you can see is that the the pan the the that paradigm shift ha is 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 able to sort of come to to light at exactly the right moment, and so I think when Remy talks about the potential of public development banks with that ten percent of uh, uh, of kind of investment potential and their catalytic potential in a global sense, that's a big difference. As as I think as as, as he pointed out, you know, pr prior to this, the focus has very much been on uh, what individual development banks might be able to do with individual countries in the developing world and less so about what is the collective potential of those banks. So from, from where I sit as a, as a non-development bank person, I think that the, 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 you really got a sense during the Finance and Common Summit and the leadership from IFD and the other, uh, the other organizers of it, of what the potential could be if you got development banks engaged, aligned, both at the international level, and I think even more importantly, at the national level. So where I sit, I think there's enormous potential. I guess the other thing I would underline is the enormous need right now. I mean, when we think about what the immediate challenge is coming out both of the, of the pandemic, I mean, let's just take vaccines, for example. I mean, vaccines is an area where for, to fully fund COVAX, for example, we're only missing about $15 billion to fully fund it and to fully vaccinate the world, which uh, I think, you know, uh, Martin Wolf uh, talked about in the Financial Times last week. If you were to do that, it would actually have a return on investment, um, something like 180 times. So for every dollar that you invest in vaccine protection globally, you would generate $180 in return. That's enormous. And yet we've not done it, even coming out of the G7. So I think that what, what uh, while Remy talks about the paradigm shift 
and the G7 commitments demonstrate that paradigm shift, we still need to move very, very fast. And so I guess the one very important thing that we need to move uh, faster is that uh, although um, we may all agree on the commitments and the validity of investing uh, in those solutions that consider uh, environmental and social elements at the same time as traditionally financial uh, financial elements. Um, we probably still lack um, a well understood and well accepted way of measuring these things because of course we do see these figures coming out. If you invest in in the in the well funded COVAX program, then you get good returns. But um, th it still feels uh, that uh, there is anecdotal evidence uh, around this rather than a well accepted and internalized view on the importance of, of doing these things. Would that be correct? And Matt is, is nodding. Let's see whether Remy also agrees. So what can we do and what maybe uh, Financing Common and other, and other initiatives and, uh, and development banks can do also to help lead the way in this sense, to find a way to really measure uh, returns and risk and returns in a new way that uh, does become internalized uh, for all types of investors. For me. It's again, it, it's not uh, for ourselves. So, um, uh, and, and it's, we are in, at a very special moment where I think there's no more competition between uh, between public and private so the the the, the private side of uh, the investment uh, has uh, yes realized that it was too fragmented and that it hadn't the right uh, dimension and and traction and so uh, all of us uh, we are experiencing and working on uh, the mobilization of uh, other players, be they foundations like uh, uh, what we are doing uh, we, we, with Matt and, and colleagues, uh, or be they um, be they private private sector um, and, and 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 private finance, um, and um, certainly on the other side on on the on the private side, there's also um, a consciousness now that. Well, probably the the way we were living before, and the the returns um, um, so high that uh, we were expecting uh, has to has to change because of uh, of again the trans the transition uh, on uh, ongoing, and so so there's a there's a real convergence between these uh, these two worlds, um, and um, a lot a lot happening. Um, uh, of course, on the on the on on the liabilities side. So, I mean, public banks uh, created the green bond market. Uh, we are creating uh, uh, progressively the, the sustainable bond market. So, we are working with private capital uh, already on a more and more significant uh, significant uh, way and and amount. Um, we are also doing it through, maybe we will come back to this, through, blend, through ben, blended finance. So a lot of, uh, on the asset side, I would say, a lot of, uh, of joint projects now with uh, commercial banks, private investors, uh, private sectors, uh, all other uh, stakeholders. And last but not least, and that was your question, maybe the most important, um, we can originate, develop, invent uh, common methodologies uh, for to qualify uh, what um, a sustainable development investment is. So a, a lot is happening on the climate side, on the biodiversity side, um, T, 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 TFSC, uh, TNFD, uh, you know, all these initiatives emerging where public banks have a, a say uh, and where uh, fora between uh, between uh, well the city of london or here in paris or or everywhere private finance uh, have started a, a dialogue with public finance uh, again to um, uh, to verify and demonstrate that we are doing the right uh, investments thank you very much matthew You've been nodding throughout yeah, well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, now we're uh, a part probably of the anecdotal side uh, of this because the things that Remy is talking about really have been building out over a decade. 
So um, one of the things that we have done with partners like AFD in particular, but uh, with, a, with a few others, is looking at uh, both how you can demonstrate uh, it's possible to do well, but do good, uh, through development-led projects. I mean, we, uh, as, as our organization, the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development, we're owner-operators in a whole range of businesses addressing binding constraints on development in the countries where we're present in Central and South Asia, Eastern Africa, a bit in West Africa. So addressing binding constraints on development, so telecommunications, large-scale clean energy projects, that sort of thing, financial services, or uh, doing things to promote maximum employment in a sustainable way. Now, over the past decade in particular, again, working with IFD and others, we've, for example, made a decade-long investment in um, healthcare system strengthening, where through a range of public-private partnerships who through or through a private uh, uh, non-profit health institutions that serve the public, with IFD, for example, one of the things we've done is uh, uh, we've we've been able to to put together deals that source concessional financing linked to outputs. So, in order to obtain certain development gains, we get a certain price, if you will, for that money. And as long as we deliver against those targets, it allows us then to keep the the, the sustainable finance. And of course, that allows us to do more. Now. We think that projects like that, or we could give you examples of, of even larger scale, say, clean energy projects in Uganda, et cetera, dealing with these blended uh, blended tranches, combining public development bank money, uh, national investment, and private investors like us. That uh, by doing that uh, uh, in, in a range of what you might call frontier markets over the course of this decade, that we're part of this process of, of uh, demonstrating proof of concept. I think, as Remy said a moment ago, we've now reached a point where that paradigm needs to become a bit more institutionalized. And so I think it would make it life easier for us, for example, if there were clearer standards around what constitutes, what qualifies as an ESG investment, where uh, does it make sense for public finance to be used uh, in order to catalyze private investment. There's still a lot of mistrust in the market, I think. I mean, when you see the way that people react to even say the European Commission's new tools around blended financing, there's a lot of suspicion about why should private companies benefit from public capital in this way. And I think that the kinds of partnerships that we have with IFD and others uh, demonstrate how you can structure those in a way where you can demonstrate not only the catalytic effect, but also the public development outcomes, and I think build trust in that system. Uh, and again, I would just say that as we as we look forward for the next decade, uh, having that level of trust so that you can bring more and more private resources into the conversation, I think catalyzed by public resources is gonna be really important. Thank you, Matt. I mean, it's very interesting you mentioned uh, the um, uh, European um, activity around this, and perhaps we can also go back to talk about what Europe is doing in, in terms of trying to um, help uh, the conversation and uh, in finding common grounds when it comes to sustainability, particularly uh, particularly the, the green side of sustainability. So hopefully, we'll have time uh, uh, later. And I just remind the audience that uh, we are going to take questions. Um, uh, I'm going to read the question from uh, the iPad that uh, the organizers kindly provided me with. Although I actually um, I think I need some someone to come and have a look and see whether I can actually read the questions from the iPad um, that I put that. I don't know whether we're going to take questions from the audience actually live here, let's say. Um, but uh, Remy, uh, back to you. So, uh, so Matt mentioned the importance of blended finance um, and uh, mobilizing, um, of course, uh, funding from uh, the private sector. I would imagine that you agree this is also very important. Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, let me please co come back a minute just to the to the public side, uh, just um, for you to to fully capture uh, then its capacity to to work with the with the private the private side. Um, uh, um, so what we are talking about is a whole. Uh, public financial architecture, uh, a global one. Uh, uh, 
people realized, of course, you have the, the multilateral development bank layer with the with the World Bank somehow on on top of the, the, the this 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 pyramid. Uh, then you have um, regional development banks um, uh, in each and every um, uh, continent. Uh, I was, for instance, in in Cairo yesterday meeting with uh, Benedict Orama, the, the fantastic CEO of uh, Afrexim Bank, which is uh, the public development bank uh, that has been uh, requested by the African Union to build the platform, the African platform to buy vaccines on behalf of all uh, African countries in, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, coordination uh, with uh, COVAX uh, and ACTA. And it's, doing, it's doing quite well and it, it comes from a public bank. And the bulk of uh, what I'm talking about is, of course, uh, the national uh, and the sub-national development banks. Uh, this is where most of uh, the financing uh, uh, is, um, is happening. For instance, uh, in, in Egypt, you have uh, MISR Bank, you have the National uh, Development Bank of uh, Egypt, and you have uh, Banque du Caire, uh, which are very large uh, financiers of uh, the Egyptian economy, and more broadly speaking, uh, in the top ten of African uh, of African banks uh, for the whole uh, for the whole region. So the 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 idea in giving a, a global voice to all these guys and to organize this uh, architecture is really to, to have access, to give access, to change the way these national institutions are operating. Uh, because for now, this field is uh, way too much uh, fragmented. Uh, and probably we, we are not allocating uh, uh, the concessional resources exactly where we should. Um, and we, we can, there's a lot of financial innovation that is possible, that is happening at this uh, national level that we have to share uh, uh, between regions. And, and, I, and, I, and I close by saying that, uh, um, keep in mind, and that's very important, that we are banks, <laughs> uh, meaning that um, uh, we are somehow beyond uh, uh, the priorities. I mean, uh, health, then infrastructure, then, because what a bank can provide in the discussion for the transition is that we are demand-led, uh, we are client-driven. And you know that the, the end game for the, the fight against climate change or for to reduce inequalities is to have the countries themselves originating good projects <laughs> and then asking for their banks to uh, accompany them, to better the projects. Um, and it's it switch from, I would say, the offer side to the, to the demand side. And this is what the bank is doing uh, all day long. Uh, and trying also to reconcile uh, the social and the environment. I mean, the challenges uh, lying on, on on the ground. And and last thing, um, uh, we are we are banks, meaning that we are searching for for sound business models. <laughs> uh, and and this is where I come to the connection with the private sector. Is that somehow we are uh, we we do not have exactly uh, the same investment thesis. Uh, we are not subsidiary, I hate this word, we are different. Uh, and probably because our shareholders are more patient, they are public, they are not expecting the same uh, uh, level of uh, return uh, or, 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 or for longer duration, or, but, um, um, but, but we are still um, uh, heading institutions uh, that are, are not at loss. I mean, so we, we, we are searching. And so when you discuss, for instance, and that was a discussion I had yesterday with Afrexim Bank, the issue of vaccines. I mean, we, we only see vaccines as a, a question of solidarity. And, and this is very important uh, to have more doses uh, coming in the countries. But when you start discussing about building uh, uh, local production capacities uh, in Egypt or in South Africa or in uh, in Senegal or in France or in in UK, then you have to come to private investments, demonstrate that there's a market, and convince uh, people that uh, it will last beyond COVID-19. Uh, I would say, and, and this is where these institutions 
uh, are also in, in in middle ground. I mean, they can connect these various institutions, these various dimensions between public uh, and, and private. Thank you, Remy. So, so you do need a connector, and I would imagine that it's, uh, Matt, you're going to say that the Aga Khan can actually serve as that kind of connector. <laughs> Well, I mean, in part, I mean, I was going to pick up on Remy's last point about the uh, precisely the the difficulty uh, even around vaccine manufacturing because it's in, in fact it's a live issue for us. We have a, a pharmaceutical manufacturing capability in Uganda that's been uh, 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 producing. Uh, not vaccines, but actually local medicines, uh, particularly around malaria medications, as well as a range of generics. We have an existing business plan to expand and build a new plant in Kenya. Uh, and and, and it, that business plan is actually not linked to vaccines. Now we're exploring right now, how can we build in a, a vaccine, either fi a finish and fill and finish uh, option or you know, uh, 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 let's call it indigenous production, uh, uh, vaccine production uh, on site. It's very, very difficult. And the immediate question, of course, you're getting as a private sector operator is, okay, yes, we need to do this as a global public good. But secondly, how can we make sure that this is a going concern for the future? And so uh, what we're trying to do based on 20 years of experience running this is addressing precisely these issues. How is it then that we can have a long range business model maybe around, say, mRNA as a platform that can potentially support many other different kinds of treatments. I think that's one of the challenges um, around, say, expanding uh, manufacturing in, it sounds like a wonderful thing, if only we just suspended trips and, you know, we uh, uh, suspended IP protections and it would all just kind of magically flow into place. That's an oversimplification. But it is quite difficult, actually, because you have to find trusted players who have the capacity to do these things uh, at scale, but also at quality. And then they also have to have the business models that work. So it, it is going to take us a little bit of time like this. But that's where I do think that organizations like uh, RFD and others and, and other public development banks can play a role. So for example, part of uh, putting together that jigsaw puzzle of what's the business model is uh, where can advanced market commitments play a role. And that's a very important place where national development banks uh, can, can help uh, do that sort of thing. And where I think public development banks of different kinds, whether international or national, can help, I would say, you might say, prime the market without completely subsidizing it. And I, and I think that's one of the things that Remy was getting at. And it's just a live example of, of, of where you, you can make an intervention that would make a difference while still maintaining market principles. And have you seen uh, markets, private sector investors and finances changing their attitudes towards uh, these kind of projects? Um, and, and in which way? And was it Thanks, I would imagine, also to the work of uh, of development banks, or because also the global conversation around the relationship between uh, risk and return, and uh, what is a, the definition of what is a return, not just financial, but of course environmental and social, is changing. Well, I mean, my personal, so I've definitely seen it change. Um, it varies from institution to institutions. There are some institutions that are more like Remis that are a little bit more comfortable with risk uh, than others. Um, there are others that are a bit more conservative on the risk. I mean, I do think that in general, thinking about the the uh, across the board uh, in 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 public development banks and and financial institutions, um, rethinking that risk reward notion is really really important. Um, and also, uh, I think to some degree, rethinking the ability to catalyze others. So where where does this kind of primary tranche of risk need to go in that uh, capital stack, as they say, or at least in the in the blending? Um, and there's there's work that needs to be done in that. I think, of course, uh, we as as nonprofit private sector would always prefer that other people are taking on as much risk or even more to some degree as we are. Um, and others, other private sector actors will certainly do that. Um, but of course, as Remy says, uh, these are public institutions that have to balance uh, that. They have to balance the, the needs of their shareholders and their publics versus what they can actually do. Um, I think that that has moved quite a bit. I think there's move there, there's room for it to move even further now that even on the, I would say, around things like ESG, et cetera, um, there is a, a, a slight shift in paradigm away from just simply 
profit at, at all sake. And what I hope is that we move away from the kind of standard 20% internal rate of return on, on every project, because there are just certain things that are that in the developing world, you can't do that. You're not going to be able to finance this, the sustainable development goals if that's your, if that's your benchmark. And before checking whether there are questions from the audience, and I would imagine that it's online, I'm going to see the questions from the chat function of the of the iPad, and, and I'll try also to take questions from uh, from here. So if uh, uh, the audience who is here with us now has questions, just raise your hands, and I'll and I'll try to and I'll definitely uh, come to you. Uh, so um, going back to what you were saying, Matt, and I would like to hear also from from his point of view. Are we going to see a sort of specialized uh, way of looking at finance? So uh, the the people that um, do have a better understanding of uh, uh, an interest maybe also in, in uh, sustainability and impact are going to power through and, and maybe the others will kind of look at it more from a distance. So are we going to, well, essentially, when are we going to see uh, finance that is sustainable, but without the need, the need to define it as sustainable? Um, Vermi first. It's 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 only a start, of course, uh, um, and um, th this is where we feel uh, we feel a, a, a special duty. Matt, uh, Matt, and I, um, uh, because of course uh, we have special uh, models and uh, we have um, a bit of comfort uh, to do that, and and and, and beyond public banks. Uh, I certainly would like to to commend what uh, what His Highness uh, Aga Khan or, or, or Prince Rahim. We are often discussing uh, uh, with him about it and what the the, uh, the, the Aga Khan Foundation, with its various uh, capacities. I mean, AKDN, ACFED. Uh, it's a very very innovative and interesting model, uh, mixing a very public uh, action with. Um, with also the private the private side, and uh, you were uh, ahead uh, ahead of the curve um, on this. Um, we at the Finance in Common Summit last year. Yes, we start. We 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 tried uh, to push the ambition, uh, and we uh, all uh, adhere to a joint declaration that is that is quite clear and, and strong. Um, and we asked for several things uh, from our shareholders and from our stakeholders. Um, first, I think a clear recognition uh, of uh, what is our role in the financial system. And, and probably for too long, uh, there was a stigma attached to, to public banks. And, and somehow it was thought that they should disappear. Uh, the, you, you had the governments with their fiscal capacity on one side, and then you had the markets, <laughs> and there was nothing in between, which is plain wrong. Because when you look, even in the UK, I mean, you, if I'm right, with EIB receding <laughs> because of Brexit, you, you, you are now creating a, a, a green bank for infrastructure. Even in the US, we'll see. The, maybe you remember that uh, President Roosevelt had a very large uh, public uh, federal development bank, which was called uh, the Reconstruction um, uh, Corporation, back in the 1930s, and we, we will see how uh, what will be the, the technical solution for the infrastructure plan that uh, President Biden uh, is discussing right now with the with, with the Congress. Will it be 100% public fiscal? Or will it be 100% uh, uh, private? Probably there will be something in between with the need for. For an accelerator for for a public institution to uh, uh, to connect, so we need to remove this stigma. We need certainly, Sylvia, you're right, to have a way stronger ma mandate uh, to push for sustainability and and for for climate and uh, inequalities, and and we need to organize an access to uh, to concessional resources that is more fluid uh, in order to for this mandate. Uh, to be uh, consistent with a business model that remain uh, robust. Uh, and, and for now, the, the, the way we allocate concessional resources is probably a sub, uh, sub optimal in my, in my view uh, to unlock the full potential of, uh, uh, of the group. And last but not least, uh, in this mandate, uh, it's not only about quality, of course, uh, we have to push for quality and uh, originate again the methodology. It's also about quantity. Uh, and here really, uh, and I think we're far from it, 
uh, we need our shareholders to ask us to mobilize. Uh, and not only to, I mean, for instance, at AFD, I'm rewarded on the volume of financing I'm, I'm doing. Uh, I would like to have two targets, one on my own financing and one on uh, what this uh, uh, amount, uh, about 14 billion euro a year, is leveraging uh, with uh, private finance or other types of, uh, of, uh, of investors. Uh, and believe me, if I had this target, I, 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 I will do it. I will do it and find and develop the instruments that will make it, uh, that will make it possible. And if you ask all of us, the 450 of us to do it, uh, that, would, that would be extremely powerful. But for that, we need to have our governments, to have the central banks, to have the UN, I mean, to receive a, mess, a signal that is more structured and that is stronger than the one we are receiving right now. Thank you, Remy. So uh, a call, uh, I guess, to action for from you to uh, to governments and, and uh, policymakers to uh, to give you these targets. Uh, Matt, I would imagine that you also agree that this would this make a difference uh, on the ground? Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a brilliant idea, actually, um, because as, as, as Remy says, you know, public development banks are, are right now measured on just the volume of projects that they're doing, but not on what they catalyze. But if you built that into the system, um, as well as the kind of ESG targets and, and signaling, the, the, the green transition uh, uh, goals that have come out, I think actually you could see a, a, a really substantial shift in the way not only that public development banks themselves work, but their interactions with the market. Um, and I think it would, you know, it, so so I, I wholeheartedly would endorse that. Fantastic. And uh, we've uh, uh, now come to the end of, of our session. We've run out of time. 40 minutes went really, really quickly. Um, so if anyone here has questions from, uh, from for, yes, there is a question. Okay, let's quiz it in. Let's quiz your, your question. If you want to uh, just say your, your name and, uh, I'm not sure there is a real microphone, but I can repeat the question if you just say it out loud. Thank you. So just to repeat the question, so the role of that technology can play, uh, specifically also uh, blockchain when it comes to to finance. Um, good, bad. Uh, where are we uh, in in terms of uh, adopting those kind of technologies, Remy? Just really quickly because I, 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 I don't want to. Yeah, again, we're, we're part, we're full part of uh, financial systems. So what is happening uh, with artificial intelligence, what's happening with blockchains, what's happening on with digital uh, in this uh, sector is also progressively uh, uh, touching uh, public banks. And, and so, yes, uh, within Finance in Common, actually, uh, there's a meeting right now between many colleagues uh, to see what should be the, the priorities for the next uh, summit, which will take place uh, in Rome uh, next uh, October. Uh, 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 discussing a lot about agriculture, agribusiness, biodiversity adaptation, but many other areas to to explore together. One of them uh, being uh, being digital, and, and and of course we will not lag behind what is happening on the commercial side of the financial sector for sure. Thank you, Madi. Do you want to add anything? I would just say very quickly that. Um, there's a lot of potential is the short answer to your question. Um, one of the things we're looking at is the 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 disruptive both potential and also threat that um, some of these technologies are going to have, especially on job creation in the parts of the of the world where where we're operating. We know that, for example, textile jobs risk to be massively uh, displaced due to advances that are being made in AI and other production techniques. But the question then would actually be how can we use that as an opportunity to leapfrog? various kinds of uh, development curves in some of these places in a way that we've seen other technologies do. I mean, when we invested in telecommunications in Afghanistan, for example, um, you were able and you know, you would recall lots of stories about how Afghanistan was able to leapfrog a certain stage of development, etc. And I think we ought to be focusing more on how we can be investing in some of these technologies to leverage them in a, in a, in a better way for some of these economies. Thank you. I can see another hand that went up, but unfortunately we, we are out of time. Uh, so perhaps there is an opportunity for you to ask the question directly to, to Matt, who is here uh, after. So thank you again, both to Remy and to Matt for um, sharing their views um, with us, with the audience here, with the audience who is watching uh, remotely. Um, clearly uh, the role of development finance will continue to uh, to remain. Uh, there, there will be a focus um, on sustainability uh, and there will be a need to use, of course, not just uh, 
public funding, but also private uh, sector funding and blended finance to reach the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there is a need, of course, of uh, about $3 trillion annually to reach those goals by 2030. So clearly, uh, all uh, financing, all funding from all sorts of all corners of the market will be needed. Uh, to follow that, uh, of course, also remember to um, to keep an eye on what uh, we at the Financial Times are doing, my colleagues on the newspaper, but also the division where I work, which is FT specialist, uh, and we serve um, uh, specific audiences in, in a more granular way. So uh, keep an eye out for, uh, of course, for that information. We'll try to serve your needs at the, uh, in the best possible way. Uh, thank you again for uh, staying with us. Thank you again to Remy and Matt. Um, and uh, that's all from us. Thanks, Silvia. Bye-bye. Thanks to you all. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Merci.